very pleased to welcome to Forward Guidance Joseph Wang uh, of, of FedGuide.com and our very special guest today, uh, Barry Eichengreen, Professor of Economics and uh, Political uh, Economy and Political Science at UC Berkeley. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you here. Good to be with you, Jack. When when you invited me, I envisaged someone, in, an elder statesman in, in his 50s. You look a little younger than that. <laughs> For you guys who don't know, Professor Akin Green's paper at the recent Jackson Hole Conference was one of the highlights there, and he's also one of the world's foremost experts in dollar, in U.S. dollars, central banking, and he also knows a lot about CBDCs as well. So this is going to be a great discussion. Yes, central bank digital currencies, that's in the future, and that's really impressive because, uh, Professor, your, your work in the historical realm, and I read a few of your books in college, I really you know, learned so much about macroeconomics from your books on, on the Great Depression. So we, we will, we'll spend history, we'll spend topics. But first, Professor, let's start, discuss your paper that you wrote for the Federal Reserve Symposium at Jackson Hole. It's, it's called Living with High Public Debt. Very thought provoking about inflation and, and debt sustainability. I first want to ask, what is it about uh, a debt level relative to GDP, gross domestic domestic products, that is unsustainable? I, I would put it slightly differently. High levels of debt relative to GDP are problematic. They create headwinds for the economy for a variety of different reasons. The Interest payments on the debt prevent governments from engaging in, in more productive investments in infrastructure and research and development and so forth. They prevent governments from meeting important social needs in, in terms of early childhood education or health care for the elderly, whatever your priority may be. They uh, can screen the national defense investment in defense and uh, security as well. There is no magic number. I, I don't think there's a magic number where debt becomes a problem from this point of view or whether or, or after which it translates into significantly slower economic growth. Uh, the level of debt to GDP that is problematic depends on the particular circumstances uh, uh, of the economy. Maybe it would be helpful if you let me explain where that Jackson Hole paper came from. Yes. I had written, co-authored a book in 2021 called In Defense of Public Debt. And the argument there was that there are good reasons for governments in emergencies to rely on, uh, on their capacity to issue public debt, to borrow, to live beyond their means when they're fighting wars or dealing with financial crises or dealing with a, a, a global pandemic that puts millions of lives at risk. So those are circumstances where historically we have seen public debt shoot up. But then prudent governments, once the emergency is passed, begin to bring those higher debt levels back down so that they have they they restore their capacity to borrow and they can do the same in the future if another emergency arises the difference recently of course have been that governments have not brought those high levels of public debt back down after the emergency passed in most cases so we didn't do that in the united states after the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and we haven't made much progress on that problem after the COVID-19 crisis. So part of the paper was to ask what has changed and what are the prospects? And in two words, what has changed is political polarization. And one of the things that I found really interesting about your paper is that you actually go through and do a study about a political polarization across the world. And it seems like your finding is that the more polarized the politics are, the, the more difficult it is to, to have these, I guess, hard decisions to get debt back under control. That's right. So Jack used the word unsustainable before. If you're going to bring down a very heavy debt burden, you need a sustained effort over a period of years 
and you can hold that together in the face of electoral uncertainty and so forth, only if you can build a broad-based coalition of political interests that share a desire to consolidate the debt and, 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 and bring debt ratios down over a sustained period. The more polarized the polity, the less people agree, the harder it is to build that kind of coalition and sustain it over time. So there are a few interesting counterexamples in re recent history. Jamaica actually was a country with a heavy debt load well in excess of 100% of GDP that has seen uh, some success in political coalition building over the last 10 to 15 years and has brought that debt ratio down quite successfully, but it's an exception to the rule. Political, greater political polarization, not less, has been the rule in the US, Europe, and a lot of other places. So one solution is government running less of a deficit or running a surplus, and that, as you said, requires people to see eye to eye politically. What are some of the other ways that debt to GDP as a, as a ratio can, can be lowered? And what are the, the challenges that come along along with them, with, which are many? Well, the debt to GDP ratio can be lowered, or governments can continue to run large budget deficits and not see their burden increase significantly if they're lucky. And by being lucky, what I mean is if the growth rate of the economy is higher than the interest rate on the debt, in effect, they can grow the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio faster than interest rates begin to balloon the numerator of that ratio. If the economy is growing faster than the level of interest on the debt. And we had a period like that in the 2010s when interest rates were near zero. Uh, think back to that those golden years and the economy was growing not robustly, but reasonably well. Now people are worried about headwinds to growth and experts on such matters like the International Monetary Fund are, are marking down their growth forecasts for the US and more generally, and everybody listening to this podcast will know how interest rates on the debt have gone up. So that fortunate set of circumstances is no longer with us. The other thing uh, governments can try to do is inflate away the debt, grow the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio through inflation rather than actual real economic growth. But investors cotton on to that strategy. And in the paper, Jackson Hole paper, we show they tend to wake up to that strategy sooner rather than later and demand more compensation, higher interest rates in order to hold public debt. So in, uh, a burst of inflation like we had in 21, 22 can bring the debt ratio down for a time, but then interest rates go up and that strategy is no longer viable. Finally, there are governments around the world that have reneged, have defaulted on their debts. Argentina famously multiple times in its history, but that's, how to put it politely, not good for the sovereign's reputation. And you can see those problems playing out. Again, everybody's favorite example in Argentina today. The debt is is hard to inflate away because investors will demand a greater return. You know, on the, on the short end of the yield curve, most mostly central banks control that rate. But longer term, investors will you know sell bonds vigorously as they have over, over the past two years, and interest costs will rise. Why was it possible that this was a viable solution, as they believe it was after the, the world, world War II? You know, in the nineteen 45 and that, that that decade afterwards what was it about the you know global capital structure you've got a book that i you know absolutely love called globalizing capital history of the international monetary system and 1945 to 1960 capital was not very global was it no so there there were financial res restrictions domestically and internationally so 
The period through the 1960s was famously the period of Regulation Q in the United States, which put a ceiling on the interest rate that banks could offer depositors. So people with savings moved their funds into treasury bills and bonds, which kept the interest rate on those instruments relatively low. There are economists like Carmen Reinhart at Harvard who point to the possibility that governments around the world will again resort to similar measures of financial repression. In the Jackson Hole paper, my co-author and I argue that the cat is out of the bag. <laughs> we have liberalized financial markets and there are powerful political interests that will push back against the reimposition of those kind of regulations. And finally, a lot of countries were able to bottle savings up at home through uh, capital account re restrictions, restrictions on cross-border financial flows. China is famously a country that continues to do that, uh, to limit capital outflows. Um, uh, imagine a U.S. government trying to limit the ability of the big banks to shift funds abroad uh, in the current political environment. In our lifetimes, it ain't going to happen. But is it accurate to say that from 1945 to 1970, that was the U.S. in, in the, the, the Bretton Woods order, wasn't there capital controls on many, many countries, not not just China, so that their you know, financial repression and you know keep inflation, inflating away the debt could be feasible, whereas it's much less feasible now. Is is that correct? That is, that's accurate. So it's not only the capital controls on cross border flows, but also the domestic financial regulations and limits, like Regulation Q, that both worked in the same direction. We argue in that book in defense uh, of, of public debt, I promise not to keep plugging it, that uh, economic growth was also unusually rapid in the third quarter of the 20th century. So what mattered was not only the low interest rate, but the high growth rate of the economy compared to the interest rate and that interest rate growth rate differential that favored debt consolidation, which a lot of countries, including the United States, but around the world, pursued successfully. So just to, to your professor's point, when we did Reg Q back, back then, a lot of the people just moved money to offshore, to London, for example, where they could escape these regulations. So like the professor mentioned, the regulations are porous, and today the economy is a lot more financially sophisticated than before. It'd be really hard to implement financial repression. I mean, think about all the innovations we have in decentralized currencies or in crypto and, and so forth. And I also would recall that not too long ago, we had a guest, Jack Peter Sella here, who was also noting that strangely, the bout of inflation had a really positive impact on our debt burden. After all, the price level went up 20% over a couple of years, but then that's not something you could easily repeat. So those two avenues don't seem to be available to us, inflating the debt. Well, we, we did that already. It only works once, as you know. <laughs> And regulation is difficult to impose financial repression. So there's that extra avenue of growth. And back in the 70s and 80s, we had a lot of things happening. We had, for example, women entering the workforce, and that's a huge boost in labor. We're not going to get that now. But we do have some other interesting things happening too, right? People talk about things like AI. We recently seem to have good productivity numbers, but they're probably not, not going to be good enough. So it definitely seems like we probably won't have that growth avenue this time around? So as an economic historian, I'm tempted to compare AI and its impact on productivity and growth with, with earlier general purpose technologies like electricity, the internal combustion engine. If you do those comparisons mechanically, you're led to the conclusion that it's going to take 5, 10, 15 years before AI shows up in the productivity statistics. Uh, when we first began to get personal computers, Robert Solow, the MIT economist, Nobel laureate, famously observed, we see the computer everywhere but in the productivity statistics. And that remained the case for about 15 years, after which productivity accelerated. Um, but 
as an economic historian, I also want to be cautious about not using the history mechanically. So could AI be different? Could uptake and reorganization and productivity payoff all be faster this time? We don't know. History points in the direction that we're going to have to be patient, but who knows, maybe a, a, a little bit less patient. And Professor, is it accurate to say that productivity is just the, the ratio of how much economic growth you get per unit of labor? So it's not something, it's something that can only, you know, it's not a key input. It is something that is, I guess, like a residual impact. Well, productivity is, is the ratio of output to inputs. So people measure the inputs in different ways for different purposes. Labor productivity is output relative to effective labor input. Total factor productivity considers not only labor input, but capital input and, 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 and so forth. So we can measure the output. We can measure the inputs, how many workers, how much capital and so forth. And what is left over is the contribution of productivity growth to GDP growth. And I think it may also be Robert Solo, who famously said productivity growth is a measure of our ignorance because it's what's left over after we've, we've measured everything else. And, and that's a reminder to be really careful about how you use and think about those productivity growth numbers because any measurement error in the measuring the output and the observable inputs gets loaded into the residual what's left over. And Professor, how do you think about how artificial intelligence will, you know, I mean, do you have, do you have a view on if it will in increase it or not and how long it could take? Because, you know, we have these venture capitalists, they, they like to talk their book, but at the same time, you know, looking at the hard economic numbers, Will this be like, you know, electricity, which or the the engine, or will it be something that is, you know, it's a nice to have, but really does not advance the economy in what is, you know, some people are saying now it will. AI is likely to reduce productivity in the very short run. It's forcing me to redo all my exams for my undergraduate courses, eliminate the homework assignments, and replace them with, with something else. But in the longer run, no doubt I'll figure out how to use it to improve my lectures and so forth. So I think of this as the Uber at San Francisco airport problem, that when Uber first came to SFO, it was much harder to get in and out of the airport because the yellow cabs and the Ubers were snarling the traffic. Nobody knew where to go. Eventually, they reorganized the airport and the traffic flow. So they have different parking lots and lanes, and it's faster and cheaper to get in and out. So I think in the longer run, we, it'll, it'll improve productivity. But in the short run, AI will create work for folks like you and me. Hey, everyone. We're about to get back in the action. But before we do, let me give you a lowdown on what's been brewing at Blockworks. Come March next year in the heart of London, we're bringing together hundreds of the world's heavyweight asset managers. I'm talking about the big hitters, fund managers, allocators, payment providers, and the major high-frequency traders. They'll all be converging at Digital Asset Summit London, the mother of all digitally focused conferences in the institutional space. If you're curious about what the big money is up to in the digital asset scene, this is the event for you. We're diving deep into the intersection of macroeconomics and crypto, dissecting where we're at at the market cycle, and we'll be getting into the nitty gritty of real world assets. So think stable coins and on-chain treasuries, it's all in mix. I'm gonna be there and so are the forward guide superstars. Michael Howell is gonna be there. There's a rumor that Joseph Wang is gonna be there. I don't know who started that rumor, but people are saying that. We're also getting into the minds of allocators, so you get a front row seat to what the big crypto money managers are cooking up these days. And because you're a dedicated Forward Guidance listener, here's an exclusive treat. Use code FG20 to get 20% off. Just hit that link at the end of this episode, so gear up, because I'm looking forward to seeing you in sunny London town come March. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. In your Jackson Hole paper, you very comprehensively cover how there actually was a, you know, a deleveraging, as you referenced earlier, in the early 2000s, particularly among low-income countries and very highly indebted countries, 
And over the past, you know, since after the great financial crisis, it really has been the advanced economy. So you know, US, Europe, Japan that have really stacked on, on the, the debt. Although you highlight that just because you know, a certain country that's an emerging market has a lower debt to G- GDP than Japan or the US doesn't mean it's more sustainable because its currency might not be printed in its, in its domestic currency, which it, which it prints. It has you know, foreign dominant debt. Other reasons, there's not a foreign foreign demand for that country's safe safe assets. So needless to say, the you know, US dollar, we can get, oh, American can get a, away with a lot more. And Japan can get away with a lot more than other emerging market countries than let's say have debt that's denominated in another currency, namely dollars. Looking at history, the last global mo- you know, monetary hegemon, the, the pound sterling, which you know is no longer the monetary hegemon, how bad does it have to get for there to be a transition away from from the dollar? The fact that the U.S. has seen its debt to GDP ratio nearly double since the period prior to the global financial crisis, and yet dollar dominance and the status of U.S. Treasuries as a safe haven have survived. That that safe haven status survived to get a little bit political, four years of Donald Trump suggests that dollar dominance is pretty robust, partly because uh, a number of other ingredients uh, of what you called dollar hegemony remain in place. The U.S. is a big economy. It has deep and liquid financial markets open to the rest of the world. It has active liquidity provider backstopping those markets in the case of the Fed. And of course, the fact that our our, 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 our debt um, is denominated in our own currency all work in our favor. And the other thing that's important here is that there is no full-fledged rival to the dollar. So the pound sterling lost ground to the dollar first after World War I and then big time after World War II because the United States was a bigger economy, a bigger exporter after, after World War I, because we developed, established our own lender and liquidity provider of last resort in the form of the Fed in 1914. So there, there was a full-fledged rival to the pound sterling in the first half of the 20th century. What is the rival to the dollar? At the moment, one might ask. We talked about the Chinese renminbi before. Uh, Markets in the renminbi are not deep and liquid, and they're not fully open to the rest of the world. The euro is the currency of a large economy, but again, a bank-based as opposed to a securities market-based economy, where there are not very many AAA-rated government bonds denominated in euros uh, to be held by banks, firms, and governments around the world. There are three euro area sovereigns with AAA ratings only, and most of their bonds are held by Europe's own banks or the ECB. So the euro denominated liquidity is simply not out there. And the other currencies that are regarded as safe and liquid Interestingly, many of them have the name dollar, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, New Zealand dollar, Singapore dollar. What is it about that name? I'm not sure. They contribute a bit to international liquidity, but those countries and currencies are simply too small to pose a first order challenge to the U.S. and the greenback. You raised a really good point. I mean, if I have a lot of money, I have to be able to park it somewhere. And there really is no other market deep enough to park a lot of money, unless you're talking about something like U.S. Treasuries. You've, you've also done some really good work looking at the dollar's share in central bank reserves. And even though it has declined a bit o- over the years, it, it really just seems to be going to smaller countries that, that seem to have become more liquid. So that, that in a sense, more investable. So it doesn't necessarily seem to imply any significant threat to, to, to the dollar's position. Yeah. You know, I wrote an earlier book published in 2011 called Exorbitant Privilege, The Rise and Fall of the Dollar. And there were two predictions in that book, one of which was right, that the dollar's share would, con- in, in global 
reserves and its role in the international monetary system would continue to erode very gradually over time as the U.S. came to account for uh, a gradually shrinking share of global trade and finance. So I'm happy to recall that prediction. It turned out to be right. The other prediction in the book was that the dollar would very gradually lose ground to the currencies of the other big economies, the euro area and the Chinese renminbi. And that one, full disclosure, turned out to be wrong, that the dollar mainly has lost market share to these non-traditional reserve currencies. I mentioned them a moment ago. The Korean won is also on the list. The Danish krona and the Norwegian krona are also on the list. And I didn't anticipate that 12 plus years ago. I think it testifies to the development of digital technology, that these smaller currencies of smaller economies have become easier to trade, hold, invest in. Anybody with a smartphone can do it now at relatively low cost. So too can central bank reserve managers. A really good example that, that I read in your in your paper was that let's say that you are a Mexican person with pesos and you wanted to get Canadian dollars. Back then, the easiest way to do that is to sell Mexican pesos, buy U.S. dollars, and then take U.S. dollars, sell them and buy Canadian dollars. And so that's because that's how the liquidity was. But now if you have more liquidity directly between pesos and Canadian, it would make sense that you wouldn't have to hold these dollars to convert to other currencies. You could just hold other currencies directly. One of the things that I've also picked up in your work recently is that you've noticed that it seems like such a big, big reserve managers are holding more gold. Is, is that some, a noteworthy trend? It seems like for, for a long time, central banks are transitioning away and from this you know, commodity-based currency, but, but it seems to be something that we hear more about these days. Right. So gold was important to central banks in the 19th century, and it still had a formal role to play in the Bretton Woods system in the third quarter of the 20th century. After that, advanced country central banks that had inherited a, a lot of gold from the past began to trim their holdings and try to sell a portion of their gold reserves without tanking the price and inflicting losses on themselves. So they would sell gold very gradually and discreetly. But what has changed is that central banks have accumulated a, a, a lot of additional reserves. Emerging markets, and emerging markets have been growing faster, so it makes sense as their economies grow and they engage in more trade, their central banks will hold more reserves to enable them to intervene in, 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 in the market when they have to. Um, after the Asian financial crisis, emerging market central banks wanted to bulletproof their economies and financial systems, partly by holding more reserves. So they accumulated a lot of dollars and other currencies, but then they began to think maybe we should accumulate some gold as well as part of our reserve portfolios. So what we've basically seen is advanced country central banks trimming their gold reserves, emerging market central banks adding to their gold reserves, and the latter tending to outweigh, at least on the margin, the former. So that's what we've seen. A bunch of the, the big uh, central banks that have, have played a leading role in increasing their gold reserves have been emerging markets, by and large. Also, economies like Russia, which you might want to call an emerging market, you might not. But given their special geopolitical circumstances, they don't want to hold bank deposits in the United States, so they hold gold. Can you just highlight how the, you know central banks right now buying gold? That's very different from the gold standard or a series of gold standards where fiat currency was you know had to be converted. There had there had to be a, a ratio, and if you didn't you couldn't pay up in gold, there was a problem. What you know there's there's a big difference now, and if if there is a big difference, what is the purpose of central banks holding? Gold, uh, gold. I mean, they'd be expected to to go up. I mean, what's the investment characteristics of that relative to a you know a, a Thai bot five year note? And you know, if 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 you have gold, why not hold some aluminum? You know, where where 
why only stop there? I mean, I guess that's a somewhat silly question, but- I No, I think, it, I think it's a very good question. The argument for gold is that you want to hold a widely diversified portfolio if you're an investor, and that might include a commodity play or two. So why are central banks as diversified investors holding gold and not aluminum or lithium or whatever? And the answer is history and tradition, that it's respectable for a central bank to hold gold, always has been. And therefore, a central bank reserve manager can add to his or her reserve portfolio of some gold without anybody raising their eyebrows. But if they added some other non-traditional commodity, people might begin to ask, what is the central bank up to? Where do you think it's it's headed for the dollar? If 10 years ago you made a prediction, your first prediction that there would be a very gradual er erosion of the dollar presence on the world stage, and that, that has been very gradual, you know, what does the next decade look like? And how long do you think that dollar hegemony will, will be with us? And what 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 will d displace it? Or is it really impossible to know? Really depends on what you mean by dollar hegemony. I tend to prefer the, the term dollar dominance, that the dollar is the dominant international and reserve currency used disproportionately in a wide variety of different cross-border transactions. I would expect that position, that status to remain intact for the foreseeable future, because I'm hopeful that U.S. financial management will remain tolerable, tolerably good, and because it is my belief that it will take time, a good deal of time, for alternatives to emerge. Will the euro emerge as a full-fledged alternative to the dollar? There has to be more liquidity in European financial markets, more high-quality, AAA-rated government bonds available to investors around the world. In 2020, in response to the pandemic, there was an agreement that the European Union, as opposed to the member states, could borrow on the markets and issue what turned out to be 850 million Euro billion euros of bonds. People ask, is this Europe's Hamiltonian movement where your, Europe will create uh, an EU treasury capable of issuing high quality EU bonds on a regular basis. Well, they didn't do that again in response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They didn't do that again in response to the energy shock that Europe faced uh, as a result. So maybe what happened in 2020 in response to the pandemic, a once in a lifetime, we hope, event, was really a one-off and the euro will not be a challenger sooner as opposed to later. What about the Chinese renminbi? The Chinese have deep financial problems at home in the real estate market, uh, in the corporate sector, uh, in local and regional governments and their financial vehicles off balance sheet operations, in other words. So they're not gonna throw open their financial markets to the rest of the world. Partly they understand that if they did that, large amounts of Chinese finance would flee the country for abroad because Chinese investors see those problems at home. Chinese investors more broadly want better internationally diversified portfolios, and they've been prevented by regulation from investing financially abroad. So the Chinese economy would plummet if they threw their markets open to the rest of the world, and that wouldn't be good for confidence globally. So I don't see you know, China being in a position to, China and the renminbi being in a position to displace the dollar anytime soon. I don't see the euro, euro area and, 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 and the euro being able to, to do that. So I think that forecast of, very gradual erosion of dollar dominance remains intact. If we in the United States engage in severe financial malpractice 
don't raise the debt ceiling, default on the bondholders, you know, do things like that. Uh, don't pass a government, a budget, shut down the government for an indefinite period. That could really undermine people's confidence in the dollar, but simply because the, con the consequences would be so severe, I think even this Congress would be reluctant to go there and at the end of the day. So you talked about the uh, Congress, the government literally defaulting on the debt, not, not paying it. But what about Congress continuing to spend and spend and, and borrow and borrow? And I think this may go to my, my, the question that began this interview, which is, you know, what are the, the consequences? You, you used, uh, I believe, the word unpleasantness. Like, in what channel is that going to represent? And I know it's not a level of, oh, it's 90, once you hit that 94% debt as a percentage of GDP, you know, it, it's, it's all going to you know, be, be in trouble. But what is, is it going to be inflation? Is it going to be a depreciation of the dollar relative to other fiat currencies, a depreciation of the dollar relative to commodities? Sort of, you know, you know in other words, why not 100%? Why not 150%? Why, why might that 40 to 60% band of you know, total government debt as a percentage of GDP for the entire globe, why, that, why might that be a healthier band than the 100 to 150 percent, you know, nosebleed levels that Japan is more familiar with. And to Jack's point, you seem, seem to have a lot of people in Congress who, who think that, you know, it, it's OK. You know, our debt is someone else's checking account. And after all, we spent all this money and, you know, look at our economy. It's, it's doing well. It seems like there are more and more people who, who actually don't even think it's a problem. Well, I think there are it, it is a very large majority in the Congress that recognizes we have a problem. But there is not a majority in the Congress that agrees on what we should do about it. So I, I, I think the Congress is, is aware that we have a situation on our hands, but they're not in a position where they can get their hands around that problem. Jack asked about inflation and dollar depreciation, whether, whether that's a consequence of this heavy debt depends on, on how the Fed reacts. Monetary policy will ultimately determine what happens in terms of inflation and what happens in the medium and longer term in terms of the dollar exchange rate. So there's a debate out there about whether the Fed is going to feel political pressure. We talked about dollar dominance before. The name for this one is fiscal dominance that if fiscal policy is too expansionary, out of control, will the monetary policymakers feel compelled to buy some of that debt with inflationary consequences in order to help the treasury and the government with its debt management problem? Or will the Fed conclude to the contrary? This is your, meaning the Congress, the executive, and the treasury's problem. And we will stick to our target of bringing inflation down to 2% come hell or high water. And we're not going to buy the debt, bail you out of, of your problem. So I, I, I think probably a majority of the economics profession is worried about fiscal dominance. And I'm in the minority, pretty much, where I think the Fed has demonstrated over the course of the last year plus that it is really committed to returning inflation to its target of 2%. We're going to have to wait until 2024 to see how successfully and exactly when. But, you know, the Fed was uh, faced with the question, are you going to risk a recession in order to bring inflation back down? And it concluded, yes, we will risk a recession in order to bring inflation back down. And I think it would similarly conclude, we will risk problems on the fiscal front in order to keep inflation at or very close to its 2% target. So I don't see inflation and dollar depreciation as necessarily being inevitable or even likely consequences of the fact that we can't get our fiscal house in order. Rather, I think the consequences will be higher interest rates. Uh, means the government is going to have to spend more to service the debt, leaving 
fewer public sector resources to invest in education, healthcare, national defense, other things that we all value. Higher interest rates are going to put pressure on private sector investment as well. Crowding out will result to some extent, and that will mean slower growth of the economy than otherwise. So that's the what, what I see as the risk. That's the argument for moving the budget toward balance gradually over time. Here comes the part that's controversial in the United States. By advanced country OECD standards, we are a low tax economy. And the obvious way of moving the budget toward balance is by raising taxes. You know, so I'm not running for office. I can <laughs> stake out this unpopular position. So you're saying mainstream economists, a lot of the economics profession are worried about fiscal dominance. In other words, if the U.S. government runs large budget deficits, the central bank, the Federal Reserve will just go along and might monetize that debt and, and purchase it. I know in the, you know, the circles of the Federal Reserve, that, that those words would, would never be, be uttered. And, you know, they are, are tell, telling what, what you said about, yeah, they're controlling, attempting to control in, in inflation and growth with, with interest rates and balance sheets. And then if the Federal Reserve doesn't monetize the debt, you'll have higher interest rate because there's a ton of treasury issuance and you know, supply will go up, demand will stay the same. So you know, price down yields up. So I know that there, you know, an, a stream of economic thought to which I think Joseph was earlier alluding called monetary, uh, modern monetary theory actually rejects quite, quite sternly that theory of crowding out that if the government issues so much paper and so much debt, the private sector won't be able to finance itself because all the money will go towards funding the government. Could you could you mount a, a defense of, of crowding out and sort of push back on that theory? Well, I'm going to try to be polite here. I never understood modern monetary theory. Insofar as I could understand it, it um, was not consistent with basic economics, but it tended to be a slippery concept that was defined different ways by different people at different times. And in any case, I think it's been discredited by the events of the last couple of years. It, you know, modern monetary theorists had argued that the government could continue to spend as it did in the early stages of the pandemic without any consequences for higher interest rates and crowding out. And lo and behold, the government continued to spend. We did a, yet another third gigantic fiscal stimulus in March of 2021. That's not the entire explanation for why inflation took off, but it's a significant part of the explanation. Inflation took off, interest rates rose. Investment has not collapsed, but investment has been constrained. So the infrastructure investment that we had hoped would be stimulated by that package has been relatively weak, relatively limp, because higher interest rates make investment more, more expensive. So as I understood modern monetary theory, it, it never challenged the notion that higher interest rates make investment more expensive. And through that channel tend to discourage it. But it did channel, it, it, it did challenge the view that more deficit spending by government would at some point translate into those higher interest rates. And evidence from the last two years has really put paid to that thesis. Thank you for that. So I think you're absolutely right that modern monetary theory, like many you know, new fangled theories, it can be hard to pin down what exactly is the text? What is the, the interpretation? And you know, I've definitely had that experience too of thinking I understood it. And then there's a new school and which, which is, you know, MMT. But I think to the, the point that MMT would say, law, uh, interest rates rose because of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve is part of the government. So why couldn't the money stay free forever and the Fed keep interest rates at zero on the short end, which the Fed, you know, can do if, if it wants to. And then the long end, you, you might even, you know, has much much less control, but it even could even do something like yield curve control, which which the Bank of Japan is is currently engaged in. Right. So I'm not a monetarist, 
either. But it seems pretty clear to me that inflation took off starting in 2021 because the Fed was behind the curve, that the Fed had not raised interest rates. It was inadvertently, for other reasons, following the advice of modern monetary theory, inflation was not supposed to react to that, but lo and behold, it did. It reacted with a vengeance. And then the Fed responded too late, but aggressively, necessarily given the circumstances. And there's a debate at the moment about whether the Fed uh, deserves credit, all of the credit or the majority of the credit for bringing inflation back down from the high single digits to where it is now around two and a half or three percent. And again, my view is that the majority of the credit probably goes to the Fed. Supply chains loosened up, the pandemic receded, other good things contributed to the decline of inflation, but it was first and foremost the reaction of the Fed. So I think that MMT prediction that uh, inflation would remain low was contradicted by what happened to, with inflation in 2021. And the idea that the Fed couldn't do anything about it was contradicted by what happened to inflation in 2023. No, I just have just one, one question about the view that about the Fed ultimately being able to remain independent and push against fiscal profligacy. Like when, when I look through the history of the Fed, it seems like, you know, monetary policy independence is something that comes and goes. Uh, during the Second World War, for example, the Fed's job was to fund the government. And when I look at politics today, it seems like the Fed chair has tr problems pointing out that um, spending too much money by Congress is, is not good. It, it seems like there's a significant hesitancy to, uh, to comment on these things, whereas in the past, let's say Chair Volcker uh, was very open about things like that. It, it doesn't seem like they have a I guess a very strong political standing, at least enough to to push up push against the Congress and to perhaps raise interest rates and cause a recession in the event that we have to do that. So, why do you think Fed independence will, will be something that remains, even if economic times stay go go poorly? After all, it's been easy this so far. Unemployment remains really low, multi decade low still. So, Joseph, you're right that central bank independence in this country uh, has not been a constant. It's waxed and waned. The episode I like to recall is in the early 1970s when Richard Nixon's plumbers, the same people who were behind the Watergate break-in, planted stories in the Washington Post about how the Fed chair was asking for a raise, and they were able to uh, you know, kind of, kind of discredit him personally in ways that forced him to give in to pressure from the White House to, to, to keep interest rates low. Why is this time different? I would give you two answers to that. Number one, evidence that if Fed independence could survive four years of Donald Trump, it can survive anything. And secondly, I think the ideology, the theory, the evidence for the advantages of central bank independence is stronger now than it was previously. So there have been a couple of decades, three decades of intensive research by academics and central bank economists on the behavior of more and less independent central banks and how that behavior affects economic outcomes. And it has shown pretty, very convincingly in my view, that central bank independence has advantages. So not only central bankers, but treasury officials and a significant number of politicians know that theory, know that evidence, appreciate the case, and that renders them more reluctant today than they would have been 40 years ago in, 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 in the time of Nixon to tamper with that independence. So no guarantees, but I think central banks are in a stronger position today in the U.S. and globally than they were half a century ago. Thank you. Joseph, Professor Eichen Green has also done a, a lot of work on central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, work that, that you're familiar. Could you sort of just tee the professor up to, to talk ab about his work? And you know, I, I, I'm someone who I, I really don't understand uh, CBDCs at all, so I, I'd, I'd like some help. 
Well, I, I can't claim to be an expert either, but I know Professor has done really good work studying the CBDC use case in other countries, India, for example. And looking across the world, it seems like many countries are thinking about rolling out a CBDC, and that could be in many forms. It could be someone, for example, holding an account with the government or holding an account indirectly, say, through a commercial bank who then holds an account, some kind of special account at the government. So there are many different types of CBDCs, and they seem to be a lot of countries interested in it. For looking at the U.S., though, does such a technology, such a tool make sense for us? I would draw a, a, a strong dis, a distinction between new digital rails for transactions, both domestically and across borders, and central bank digital currencies. So I think the case for investing in those new digital rails is really, really strong. That in India, the universal payments interface where everybody, every individual can transfer money to every other individual using a, a basic cell phone, a digital technology provided by the government, that's really strong. And having FedNow basically a 24 7 instant payment system in the United States, that's strong. You know, run, proprietary system run by the Federal Reserve. The argument for that is strong too. And across borders, Western Euro Union is experimenting with blockchain and Ripple, a company in San Francisco, is experimenting with technologies to move money across borders. Arguments for those private sector initiatives are strong as well. Do central banks need to issue their own digital token, which would reside in a central bank app or wallet on your smartphone, or maybe on your commercial bank app on your wallet, the central bank would issue the digital token only to your commercial bank, which would issue it to you. So I've just described a retail CBDC where the central bank puts the token directly in your wallet and a wholesale CBDC where the central bank issues the token or the digital dollars to commercial banks, which turn around and issue it to you. Um, that's the wholesale version. Do we need to add that to the, ex to the ongoing development of new digital rails for payments? I think the case for that is much less clear. So the argument that some central bankers make at the end of November, as we're recording, we're approaching the end of November, John Cunliffe is retiring as the deputy governor of the Bank of England in charge of payments. And he's also the retiring chair of the Bank for International Settlements Committee on cross-border payments. He argues that adding a central bank digital currency to this mix is important because we have to really be sure that these payments we've been talking about are final and that the central bank guarantees them and stands behind them. And that will only be the case if it issues a CBDC that can be used for these purposes. So I've just given you the argument for and the argument against. The argument against is that we can leave this to the private sector and other maybe government-backed digital initiatives that don't involve a CBDC. And the argument for is Cunliffe's argument about finality of guaranteed payments, that only with the latter will there be real confidence and widespread adoption. So it's up to you to make up your minds. And so there's two versions, wholesale CBDC, where basically the Federal Reserve, with some new technology, extend, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, or this is an inappropriate analogy, but extends the reserve system where you know, U.S. commercial banks have assets that are the liabilities of the Federal Reserve that now pay interest. They, and by the way, Professor, I learned this all from, from Joseph, but so they, they extend that system to many more private entities, including foreign commercial banks, so that exchanging money on that network is, is much easier. And then the version two is everyone can do that. And it's like a Venmo that is 
created by the Federal Reserve. So I guess in that second scenario, what are the advantages other than what some people would call social engineering, which you know it can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing, but let's say the Federal Reserve decides or the government decides, you know, Bill Gates, he's got a lot of money. Let's have his risk-free interest rate at two percent, and you know, people who are disadvantaged, let's give them a risk-free rate of ten percent, and they kind of remediate that you know inequality, wealth inequality. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it certainly would be a big step, and that would definitely not be a central bank in- independent. So. I guess, what would the advantages be other than social engineering? And then what are your thoughts on that sort of social engineering potential? I think the argument is all about ease and convenience and low cost of payments. That there are people when they want, if they're working in the US and they want to remit money to Mexico, uh, historically, they've had to pay a big chunk, like 7% on a small transaction to Western Union. And if we had uh, a retail CBDC that could be used both in the U.S. and Mexico, or if the Mexican peso CBDC and the U.S. dollar CBDC both ran on the same blockchain, uh, we could exchange one for the other at basically zero cost. So that would be the argument for, and arguments against have to do with privacy, um, which is is a concern here when we talk about China's electronic CNY or China's own CBDC, which it's piloting at home, a concern in the minds of many people has to do with privacy and confidentiality of one's transactions. So I think there is skepticism in the U.S. Congress about U.S. central bank digital currency, partly on social engineering, privacy, confidentiality grounds. Would the Fed be tracking everybody's transactions? If if you want to do a small value transaction anonymously, you just use cash. Today, would that option go away? I think the Fed and other central banks contemplating the equivalent have made pretty clear that they will continue to issue cash alongside a CBDC. But those are the kind of concerns that our Congress people in their 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 wisdom profess. Just tying in our earlier discussion, having this global payments rail, really convenient, some might call it the dollar system, right? <laughs> it's something that we are already using, but just to our advantage, of course. Is this something where if another country China, Sweden adopts it and the US doesn't, the US might fall behind in the same way like if you know the world's number one military power, if it doesn't adopt this new military technology, other countries will become more powerful. Is it the kind of thing where even if the Federal Reserve doesn't want to adopt it, it will have to in order to stay, you know, dollar dominant? Well, if Sweden issues a central bank digital currency, they're probably the country that has studied the possibility most extensively. The number of Swedish krona out there are simply going to be too small to make much of a difference for the dollar and the globe. The big dog here, excuse the phrase, is China, a big economy that has begun to move down the, the, the road of, of issuing a CBDC that has piloted it in uh, a, a growing number of, of Chinese cities. At the moment and for the foreseeable future, you have to be resident in China in order to hold and use it. So you can only download the ECNY app, app, either the central banks or one of the big commercial banks app, if you are resident in China, if you're a Chinese citizen, or if last year you were visiting the Olympics there. And that means you can't really use it for cross-border transactions because you can't pay a non-resident with it. And because of the capital controls that we talked about before, that situation is not going to change anytime soon. So there may come a point where, where a big economy like China has opened its financial markets to the rest of the world and its central bank digital currency begins to circulate globally. Uh, and and make a significant dent in uh, dollar dominance. But I think the Fed has quite a number of years to contemplate that possibility before it has to do anything. 
Mm. Thank you. Well, Professor, thank you so much for, for coming on for guidance and, and sharing your knowledge. Uh, people should check out your, your Jackson Hole paper, which we'll, we'll link to in, in the description, so as well as your many, many books, most recently, In Defense of Public Debt. And one of my personal favorites, Globalizing Capital. There we go. Put, put it up on, on screen. So what are, are there any paper that you're working on now that might come up down, down the line you know, that you're excited about? What are you, what are you working on, on now? What's, what's the pipeline? Well, I actually have a paper that is coming in a Korean journal. They commissioned me to think about China's economic slowdown, its causes, and whether that slowdown is mainly uh, rooted in, in economics or in politics, whether the slowing growth of, uh, of the Chinese economy is unavoidable, or whether it is due to policy mistakes that they have inflicted on on themselves. So I've just given you four explanations for the slowing growth of, uh, of the Chinese economy, and I think there is some merit to all of them. So it is called the Korean Development Institute Journal of Economics, one of the big think tanks in South Korea. Look for me there. Well, that sounds really exciting. Yeah, I know China, you know, what we've been talking about is, I think, is you know, public government debt. And I think you know, China it runs a very large uh, trade surplus, but they, their, their private sector has a, a ton of debt. We will be on the lookout for that. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. And Joseph, thanks for joining too. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank, thank you. you both. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.